I like walking in the woods. I find it quiet and peaceful. One summer evening, I was walking towards an old barn. In the past, it had belonged to some woodmen who stored their logs in it. And when they left, I took it over and used it for storing things. I can't remember what I was thinking about, but I know I was thinking very hard and not concentrating at all on anything around me. Suddenly, I was jolted out of my daydreams by a strange, high-pitched sound. I stopped and looked about. Just as I realised the sound came from above, a large circular object flashed across my head and I was deafened by the noise it made as it crashed through the sound barrier. As you can guess from this, the thing was going very fast. But while I stopped, trying to unblock my ears, there was another enormous sound and a flash of light about a mile away. The thing had crashed. I started running towards it, but it was now pretty dark and after a fruitless search, I went home. As the days passed, I thought less and less about the incident. And it must have been, oh, a week later that I again found myself wandering along the path to my barn. Suddenly, I stopped. Well, what was that I heard? This time it was not the high-pitched scream or a sound like aircraft breaking the sound barrier. This time it was a voice, and the voice was singing. Well, what is so strange about a voice singing? Well, I promise if you'd been there with me and heard that voice, you'd not ask such silly questions. Well, after a few moments, I began to make out the words. And they were very strange, too. I stumbled on towards the sound and presently I arrived at a huge tree in a little clearing not far from my barn. I looked up into the tree and saw, in the dusk, a dim shape. Come down before you hurt yourself, I shouted. The voice had stopped. For a moment there was silence and then feet slithered and crashed through leaves and branches and suddenly in front of me was the most extraordinary creature I'd ever seen. I'm a fairly brave person, but I nearly jumped out of my skin. Good evening. Hello. My, you are a funny-looking thing. I beg your pardon? You are very strange-looking. Well, I like that. I was just thinking the same about you. I suppose you must have been. But you must admit that your one head makes you look rather naked. And only four fans... I beg your pardon. Fans! Oh, of course. Yes, I haven't learnt your language very well yet. I've only been here four days. You call them hands and feet. Well, we call them fans, because we can use them for hands or for feet. You can't even do that. No, but those ten pairs of fans make you look a bit like a caterpillar. And what is wrong with caterpillars? Lots of my friends, and even some of my best friends, are caterpillars. We stopped and looked at each other for a moment, and suddenly we were both laughing. How very rude of me. My name is Alan. How do you do? Please call me Gumflump. Gumflump? Now, that's a strange name. Please don't start again, Alan, or I'll be forced to show you how weak your little body is. He seemed to sense a challenge in my eyes, because before I could think, there I was lying on my back with Gumflump sitting beside me, grinning like a Cheshire cat. If you can imagine a Cheshire cat with two heads, with one eye in each, and the broadest grins, two of them, that you've ever seen. Well, that's not fair, I said, dusting myself off. Ten pairs of fans against two isn't fair play. Besides, you must be twelve feet long. Gumflump looked sad for a second, and I wondered what I'd said to upset him. I know I'm only small, but I will grow up one day. Grow up? Is this some sort of a joke? I mean, you're twice as tall as I am for a start. I am only little, 
What do you expect from a 50-year-old? I obviously looked very confused, and he went on to explain that he was 50 years old, but on his planet, people lived to be 1,000 years old or more. And so 50-year-olds were children, really. It was very confusing, but I got the idea. Well, we must have talked half the night, sitting there under that tree. And Gumflumps was one of the strangest stories I've ever heard. His mother and father were a survey team mapping all the stars in the universe. They'd taken their young son with them on this long trip through the dark voids. A week before that cold evening, their flying saucer had come down out of the night and had indeed crashed in my woods. They'd crawled from the wreckage and with a last dying effort had managed to conceal the ship from prying eyes. Gumflumpf had waited several hours for his parents to let him out before he realised that something must be wrong. His great eyes filled with tears as he went on to tell me how he had scrambled out of the wrecked ship to find two great bodies lying still with fans entwined. He'd buried his mother and father under the tree where we sat. My first problem was what to do with Gumflumpf. As I explained to him that people were bound to see him if I left him in the woods, and as they often hunted for rabbits and things, they might think he was a wild animal and shoot him. Gumflumpf stiffened, and his great eyes opened wide. Do you mean you people actually shoot animals? And then we were at it, hammer and tongs. I argued, or tried to argue, that we lived on animals but he could not or would not understand. On his planet, everyone lived on fruit and vegetables. Eventually, though, I managed to quieten Gumflum down and persuaded him that he had to come to my house. I wasn't very keen on this myself, as I didn't know how my wife and children would feel about it. We had to risk it, however, and Gumflum and I set off along the path towards the house. You wait here, Gumflum, I said when we reached the gate and I'll go in and prepare my family a little. Gumflump said nothing, but flopped down and looked as though he'd gone to sleep. But I knew he hadn't. What he was doing, I didn't find out until later. I got to the front door and called out, Hello! The children came tumbling out of the sitting room. I called my wife from the kitchen and explained exactly how I'd met Gumflump and what we talked about, and that at that moment he was lying outside the front gate, I thought, asleep. Now, my family are a bouncing lot and seem to have more energy than 20 people. But now they sat, all of them, quite calmly looking at me. Well, what's the matter with you all, I cried. Are you struck dumb? Aren't you going to say anything at all? Well, very softly, almost in a whisper, my wife said, Why don't you invite him in? I was puzzled but decided not to argue with her and turned on my heels and walked down the garden path. A gumflump, I called. Gumflump! He started and lifted his two great heads. His eyes, however, looked different. They were shining with a sort of blue light. But as I got closer, the light seemed to dim and then go out. Gumflump! You have spoiled it! Well, before I could ask him what an... There's a scream from the house. It... I rushed into the house and there was I her. I picked her up and pushed cautiously into the room. I'm sorry about that. I was trying to keep them nice and calm when you came out of the house and called me, and I stopped concentrating. What on earth are you talking about, Gumplum? I'll try to explain, but your brain is very different from mine. I have a certain power, if you like to call it that, which you humans do not have. I can send thoughts through the air, something like your radio, Except they don't come out of a loudspeaker, they come out of your head. You were sending peaceful thoughts into my family's heads, were you? Right the first time. Now, if you'll just keep quiet a moment, I'll make sure your wife doesn't faint again as soon as she sees me. And he settled down on the floor and closed his eyes again. At last, my wife's eyes opened. She sat up with a jerk. I put my arm around her, but before I could say anything, she pushed me aside. I'm sorry I fainted, she said. I seem to know this gumflump of yours. I seem to know about his family. You don't believe me? 
I glanced at Gumflumpf. He winked one of his eyes, and then he introduced himself. How do you do? I am delighted to meet you. And with that, he reared up on his last pair of fans and stretched four or five out towards my wife to shake hands. I could hardly help bursting out laughing as Gumplump and my wife solemnly shook hands. Well, with all of those fans, it took quite a long time, as Gumplump insisted on using every one. We only use one hand to shake with Gumplump, I explained, but this didn't stop him. Well, now, Gumplump had arrived and had not created too much panic. The question was what to do with him now. Time was getting on and the children should have been in bed ages before. Of course, none of them wanted to go to bed and they insisted they'd never be able to sleep. But in a couple of minutes, they were yawning their heads off. Well, even I felt tired, which was silly, really, because it wasn't all that late. Then I caught Gumflum looking very slyly at me. He was up to his tricks again. He was putting through the idea to us that we were tired and it was working. My wife was dropping off in a chair and it looked as if the whole family was prepared to go to sleep in the sitting room. Stop it, Gonflump, I said, and before he could answer, I'd gathered up Peter and Paul, and calling Frith, I took them off to the bedroom. When they were bedded down, my wife, Gonflump, and I settled down, and Gonflump told us more about his travels. Fascinating stories of planets and stars and different people. We also have all sorts of different people on our planet, Gonflump. We have very short ones and some very tall ones, we have uh, black ones and yellow ones, brown ones and white ones. Why have you left yourself out? What do you mean? Well, you have just given me lots of colours of people, but you haven't mentioned pink ones. <laughs> oh, no, Gumplum. We call the pink ones white ones. Why? Well, I, I don't know why. But if you prefer, you can call me a pink person. And a pink person he called me from that day onwards. We were all a bit bleary-eyed in the morning as Nanette, my wife, Gumplump and I had sat up till the early hours talking. My wife started to cook breakfast and then came out into the garden where I was working, looking a bit worried. What's he going to eat? she asked. I remember you telling me he was a vegetarian, so what can we give him? Well, I hadn't thought about this. He'd lived on berries and things in the woods. And we returned to the house and as we entered, the children were just sitting down to their cereals. Gumflum's eyes gleamed, and a fan shot out and grabbed the packet. He tipped back one huge head and opened his mouth. The next thing, the whole packet of flakes had disappeared, and he was crunching away merrily. We were all rather amazed at the sight, and then started to laugh. But Gumflum was quite upset. What is the matter now? Haven't you seen anyone eating before? You really are just a little boy, aren't you, Gumplum? You are a 50-year-old little boy, and I'll have to teach you manners. Now sit down there. Gumplum looked at me very strangely for a moment, and then sat down quietly next to me, perched on four fans, which still brought his head high above the table. Next, I got my wife to set a place for him with knives and forks and spoons. She got the biggest bowl we had and filled it with more cereal and put sugar and milk on it. I picked up my spoon and started to eat my cereal. You do it like this, Gumplump, I said, moving the spoon towards my mouth. Gumplump watched with interest for a moment and then started to copy me. The only difference was that, as I said before, he was very much taller than we were when he sat down and he couldn't get his head down towards the table. So he filled a spoon, holding it in his lower fan and then passed it from fan to fan until it got to one of his mouths. Well, for a big chap like that, it was all a bit slow, until Frith hit on the splendid idea of using two spoons. Now, they were soup ladles, actually. I didn't get much breakfast down as I sat and gazed at this wonderful sight of spoons going up and down like a conveyor belt, while Gumflump crunched and slurped happily. <laughs> 
I could see we were going to have to increase our grocery order. For when he'd finished another few packets of cereal and about half a gallon of fruit juice, Kumflumpf looked around for more food. We couldn't give him bacon, and he wouldn't eat eggs either. However, Gumflum piped up. Excuse me, but last night when I was waiting to come in, I just happened to nibble at a rather delicious thing in your garden. I don't know what it was called, but it was the nicest food I've ever had. I had visions of all my prize rose bushes being gobbled up. But when we went outside, I was delighted to find that Gumflum had tried one of my cabbages. So that was one problem solved. And for the rest of the morning, Gumflumpf helped me in the garden. Eventually, my wife called us in for lunch, and afterwards we sat out on the porch. Gumflumpf was lying on the cool stone with his eyes closed. And suddenly he spoke. I jumped because I thought he was asleep. Have you got a place at least half the size of your house with just one room? I looked at him a bit puzzled, and he repeated his question. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I have a huge old barn right in the middle of the woods. It was part of a sawmill that went bust, and I got it cheap because it was very broken down. Uh, what do you want it for? I'm afraid I can't tell you that. Not yet. But will you please trust me? I was puzzled by Gumflum's air of secrecy. But he was a nice chap, and I felt sure he wasn't going to get up to any mischief. When he still didn't turn up at supper time, I thought I'd better go and look for him. However, as I got to the front door, he arrived. His suit, for want of a better word, of a shiny silvery material was covered in what looked like grease. And he looked very tired. What's the matter, Gunflum? said my wife, suddenly appearing beside me. Oh, you poor thing. Are you all right? Uh, Gunflum nodded both his heads and sat down and said, Don't worry about me. I'm just a bit tired. I have been working rather hard. Although we questioned him for quite a long time about his work, he wouldn't tell us anything. I suggested that he went into the garden and I'd get the hose out and clean him down. He smiled and told us not to bother. He pressed a small stud in his suit, which glowed and shone even more brightly for a second. And hey presto, he was clean again. Why, Gumflum, that's marvellous, my wife cried. What did you do? A Gumflum looked a little brighter. I must apologise, because I didn't think to clean myself up before I arrived. My mother and father often used to scold me about it. This is what I suppose you would call a self-cleaning suit. When I press the stud, the suit becomes clean. The next day was Saturday, and although I'd made the children promise not to say anything about Gumplum, very early in the morning a surprising number of little heads peered through the hedge and I heard soft whispers and an occasional giggle. Frith, I said very sternly, did you tell the children about Gumflump? Paul, who'd suddenly gone very red in the face, suddenly piped up and said, I did, Daddy. Well, I couldn't get angry with him. It was too big a secret to keep. Well, the next thing was to decide what to do. As my children had not been very alarmed at meeting Gumflump, I reckoned it would be safe for the other children to meet him. So I opened the front door and called them to come in. Uh, they weren't too keen at first, but after a few moments, about 15 of them crowded into the hall. Now, children, I said, you've probably heard that I have a visitor. Uh, their eyes were bright, and Christopher, who was the eldest, stepped forward. Is it true, then, he said, have you really got a monster from space staying with you? I said very quietly, he is not a monster, Christopher. He's a creature, if you'd like to call him that, and he comes from another planet. He doesn't look like us, and when I met him, I must admit I was a bit startled. But then so was he, because he said he'd never seen anything quite like me. So if you think that he's a monster, he may well think the same about you. Now, I'm not going to say anything more, but I'm going to take you through to meet him. He's quite large, and he has two heads. I opened the door of the sitting room and led the way in. The children crept into the doorway and then stopped. There was a gasp of amazement. And then they shrieked with delight. Gumplum, you will have guessed by now, is no fool. He'd borrowed a couple of my wife's hats and was perched in the middle of the floor wearing one on each head 
and singing. Well, this had broken the ice completely, and the next moment he was surrounded by the children, all chattering and asking him questions. Presently, they trotted off into the garden, and that was the last I saw of them for the rest of the morning. One day, I was wandering deep in the woods. I turned my head to listen. There it was again. Where are you? I shouted. Then I realized that I'd heard that call for help. Not through my ears, but in my head. Well, that's impossible, I thought. But just at that moment, there it was again. It's almost impossible to explain, and it's a very strange feeling indeed to hear voices in your head. But I had definitely heard it, and what is more, I was now convinced it was Gumflum's voice. I can't explain how I knew, but I did. I was about to shout, where are you, for the second time, when I realized it would be a waste of time. If Gumflum was somehow sending me a thought message, then he could be anywhere. Also, if he'd been close by, he would have shouted in a normal way, if you can call Gumflum's shouts normal. I smiled for a moment as I remembered the noise he made when he was really trying and using his two mouths for the job. There it was again. Now I knew what I had to do. I kept very quiet and concentrated on Gumflum. Where are you, Gumflum? I thought. And then I tried to clear my mind of everything. It's jolly hard to do. You try it sometime. Nothing happened. Well, I wasn't sure what should have happened, but I suppose I'd hoped that I was sending a thought message back to Gumplum. Well, it hadn't worked. Now what? Just then came... Thank you for opening your mind, my friend. I find it easier to talk to you now. Please try to keep your mind clear. You are becoming hard to communicate with. I'm in the wood about a mile in your measurement from the farm. I can see a church spire to the left, and the sun is setting almost behind it. Is that clear? Now I knew exactly where he was. And as I ran through the trees, Gumflum repeated his message, just in case. Oh, how I wished I could speak to him in his mind the way he was speaking in mine. I kept running as fast as I could towards the spot where I knew he was, and ten minutes later I found him. But this wasn't the Gumflum I knew, all happy and singing one of his strange songs. He was lying at the foot of a huge oak tree, his ten pairs of fans wrapped round his long body. He was shivering all over, and his two great eyes were heavy with tears. Oh, Gumflum, what's wrong, I said. I think I have caught one of your terrible earth diseases. And then he threw back both his heads, his mouths opened, and before I could imagine what he was going to do next, he sneezed. And what a sneeze. I stood there, deafened for a moment, and then I laughed. Gumflump had caught a cold. Why do you earth people laugh at the pain? His eyes were full of tears as he said this. Oh, Gumflump, I'm sorry. But you see, I was so worried about you, and as I was running through the woods to find you, I thought something terrible had happened to you. It has. I've caught some of your dreadful earth germs. On my planet, there's been no sickness now for a thousand years. But here you are all sick. Now, Gumflump, you've got a cold in your heads, that's all, I'm sure. Well, we've got to work out how to cure you. First, we must get you to the house, then fetch a doctor. Uh, uh, His great eyes streamed. 
And as the echoes of the sneeze died down, he went on. No, thank you. I want to be cured. And your doctors can't do that. I could see it was no use arguing with him. And I had to think of some way of carrying him to the house, so that at least he could be warm. Now, Gumflump is, as you know, 12 feet long, and is a very big chap indeed. I'm pretty strong, but even very strong people can't carry a large horse. I would need to get some help from the village. I put my jacket over Gumflump. Poor chap. He did see me. I didn't think the jacket would really help much, but Gumflump thanked me when I explained what I was going to do. In no time at all, I'd arrived at the village. Luckily, it was about six o'clock, not later, and only the very small children were getting ready for bed. I knocked at one or two doors and told the older children in each house what was the matter. Within a few minutes, I had all the help I needed. Now, kids, first of all, thanks for coming, I started. I hope you know what the trouble is. However, I know what can happen if you pass a message on from one person to another. A has been sold, said an excited little voice. Sold, I said. Now, that's exactly what I've just been saying. The messages got mixed up. No, Gumflump has a cold, not has been sold. <laughs> he feels too ill to walk, and he's far too heavy for me to carry to the house, so I need help. I looked at the circle of eager faces. They all loved Gumflump as much as I did, and were prepared to do anything for him. But we can't carry him either, said Christopher, a well-built 12-year-old. I'm strong, he went on. But that's no good. Gumflump is bigger than my father's horse. Now you're getting warmer, I said. Run and tell your father what's happened and ask him to bring his hay wagon as fast as possible. While you're gone, we'll make a stretcher. The next 20 minutes went by like a flash. The children produced a couple of long poles and lots of sacking and old pieces of harness. We nailed strips of leather harness between the poles, then stretched the sacking over them and nailed it securely down along the poles. Just as we were finishing, there was a creak and a squeak, and Mr. Mitchell's hay wagon came down the hill. We quickly popped the huge stretcher on the back of the wagon and scrambled in. Gumflump raised his heads as we appeared through the woods. The next thing, warm little hands were stroking him, and little whispers of poor Gumflump were comforting him. Well, they say many hands make light work, and it's true. Even little hands can help. Mr. Mitchell and I got hold of the stretcher on either end, and the children lined up on one side. Now, Gumplump, lie down flat. What on earth for? Do as you are told. Gumplump sighed and sank back on the earth. Now, kids, I went on, walk over the stretcher, get hold of Gumplump, and roll him towards you. How we all laughed while Gumplump grumbled that he was feeling dizzy and that we were pinching him. Oh, you are a fusspot, I cried. Here we are trying to help you and all you do is moan. You always tell me that it's earth people are ungrateful and selfish. Very true. I apologise. It must be your earth germs that help make me nasty. The children grinned and looked up at me. We all knew Gumflump was definitely feeling better. Now, I commanded, as general in charge of this operation, I order you to get on with the job. The next stage was the hardest. We want equal numbers of you on either side of the stretcher. When Mr. Mitchell and I start to lift, you must all lift as well. Gumflump is too heavy for the two of us, but if you help, we can do it. We sorted out the various sizes and soon had six children aside. Lift, I ordered, and with a few grunts and groans, mostly from Mr. Mitchell and me, Gumflump was lifted slowly into the air. Don't drop me. I'm not well. If you don't keep quiet, we'll do just that. A step at a time, we staggered over to the hay wagon. We managed to get one end balanced on the back and slid the whole thing, gumflum and all, safely in. Now, Chris, I cried as we moved off. It's Saturday, so will you go and ask the parents if you can all stay up until 7.30? And then ask Dr. Harvey if he can come to the house. Tell him I think Gumflump has a cold. But Gumflump interrupted me. No, Alan, you don't understand. I'm different from you. Inside, I am different, and your medicine might not be good for me. 
Well, you caught our germs. True. Quite true. But your medicine does not cure colds. Mine will do more than that. It will stop me ever catching colds again. Take me to the barn. Perhaps at long last I'd find out what Gumplump had been up to. To the barn, Mr. Mitchell, I shouted. Let's see if Gumplump is pulling our legs. Gumplump just snorted two snorts, one from each nose, and would not speak for the rest of the trip. When we arrived at the barn, Gumplum tried to get himself over to the door, but he just couldn't make it. Oh, Gumplum, I said impatiently, let me do it. He looked at me for a moment and then silently handed me the key. I tingled with excitement as I opened the huge doors. Inside the barn, it was gloomy and dark. I noticed a new light switch on the left-hand side. Well, this was puzzling, because I'd never been able to afford to run electricity that far. This must be Gumplum's doing. I pressed the switch, and there was a hum, and suddenly the place was flooded with light. Gumplum had done a good job. As I turned to congratulate him, I stopped. There, standing in the middle of the barn, was a large oval ship. Now, how can I describe it? It was made of some shining, silvery material. Not the silver of Gumplum's suit, more like stainless steel. It had portholes all round the sides and it nearly filled the barn. This must be the craft in which he and his parents had crashed many months before. I'd half suspected that this had been Gumplum's secret and that he'd been trying to repair the ship, but now I knew. The children had crept up behind me and were gazing in awe at it, sitting there, sleek and gleaming, looking as if it would leap into the air at any second and streak off towards the stars. Gumflumpf asked me to board the ship and told me where I'd find a large box with a cross on it. They explained that they too used a cross for marking medicine. Uh, Gumflumpf showed me how to get into the saucer. You pushed the hull in a certain place and part of it folded down to become a sort of stairway up into the ship. Once inside, I quickly found the box. I thought I'd find the sort of thing we keep in our houses, something full of bandages and iodine and things like that. This box was very different. It looked like a box, all right. And it did have a little cross painted on the top. It was about three feet long, three feet high and three feet wide. I bent over it and tried to pick it up. The moment I touched it, it started to make a humming noise. I was out seconds, and I don't mind telling you, I was scared. Gumflumpf, I said. The box started humming at me. Poor Gumflumpf, his eyes streaming and his huge body shivering, still managed to laugh. You are funny, Alan. Do you think I would ask you to do anything or touch anything that could harm you? You Earth people must learn to trust a little more. I'm too tired to tell you off now. Please get the box. A huge shudder ran through him and he slumped back on the floor. But before I could move, Christopher was flying up the stairs and into the saucer. I felt very ashamed as I thought of what Gumplump had said. It was true. But before I could continue with these thoughts, Christopher was back with the box. was now humming and making a noise, something like a typewriter being used. The children all clustered round and Gumplum thanked Christopher. He then bent painfully over the box and touched the painted cross with one of his fans. The noise from the box grew louder for a moment, then stopped. It was so quiet in that shed you could have heard a pin drop. I think we'd all stopped breathing. I know I had. I looked around. Not a sound or a movement from any of us. The Gumplump was quite still too. We waited and waited. Then suddenly the box seemed to come alive. Tiny little arms seemed to grow out of it. One fastened itself on the fan that was touching the box. 
One of the girls gave a scream and started to run for the door. Don't be afraid, Mary. When you go to the doctor, he holds your wrist to take your pulse. Well, this box is a sort of doctor. It is taking my pulse now. And in a moment, these other arm things will start working. Almost as if they'd heard him, three other arms started to grow and grow. They wrapped themselves round Gumplum's middle and suddenly he stopped shivering. His eyes dried up and in about two minutes the arms unwrapped themselves and went back into the box and that was that. Gumplum looked at our surprised faces. He jumped up and did a little dance. His great eyes gleamed. He threw back his heads and sang. With that, he started to do the strangest dance. I laughed, and so did the children. For a moment, we all danced and sang Gumflum's song. And then I looked at my watch. The children knew what that meant. Bedtime for them and supper time for me. Yes, I could do with a few pounds of carrots and cabbages myself. I was getting a little worried about Gumplum because I could sense he was beginning to fret for people of his own kind. We settled down to a regular routine again and I went about my chores, feeding the animals and settling to writing. Gumplum again fell into the habit of spending his mornings in the barn and afternoons playing with the children. The only difference this time was that I knew what he was doing. And from his comments and the little songs he sang, I realised the flying saucer must be nearly repaired. One day, a few weeks later, I heard him singing as he came towards the house. There was quite a lump in my throat, but I forced a smile as he came in. Good news, Gumplum, is it? I inquired. He danced and did a few cartwheels. It is finished. It is finished. Come and see. I looked around to see if the family had heard, but they all seemed to be occupied, so Gumflumpf and I set off for the barn. When we arrived, Gumflumpf threw open the big double doors with a flourish, stepped back and pointed inside. The strange metal gleamed in the sunlight, and a sort of humming came from the machine. What is more, it wasn't resting on the ground, but floating about a foot off it. You're ready to go, Gumflum. No, not quite, Alan, not quite. But I want you to be the first to see my machine in action. Would you care for a quick spin? Now, I wasn't at all sure about this, but I'd already flown many times in aeroplanes and thought that it couldn't be very different. How wrong I was. A Gumflum touched the side of the machine and a small set of steps unfolded down to the ground. Inside was one fairly large room or cabin with portholes all around. The driving seat, well at least I took it to be the driving seat, was right in the centre. It was as long as Gumplump and gently curved. I have never seen such an area of winking lights and strange machinery. All round the edge ran a continuous bunk, which I gathered could be used for sleeping or sitting. Gumplump pushing switches here and there, showed how food came out of one nozzle and drinks out of another. With that, he sat himself in the driving seat, and for once I saw him using all his fans. They flicked in and out like lightning, adjusting knobs and moving levers. There was the tiniest of lurches, and I saw we were moving slowly out of the barn. For one moment, we hovered over the wood outside. Then, before I could take a breath, we'd risen to 10,000 feet. Now, if you've flown in an aeroplane and climbed very fast, you know what a strange sensation it gives you in your tummy. Well, this was worse. Far worse. Gumflump, do you have to do that? Gumflump glanced around, puzzled, and then he smiled. I'm sorry, Alan. I forgot how frail you humans are. Then he paused and looked a little worried. I shall have to remember that. 
When I asked him why, he ignored my question and pointed the saucer towards the English Channel. Within minutes we were flying over the sea and in ten minutes we'd reached the Mediterranean. He asked me if I'd like a quick dip. I would have loved it, but I could imagine what would have happened if Gumplum had landed his flying saucer on the beach at Cannes. Reluctantly, I suggested we head for home. In no time, we, we were back. When I told the children about my adventures, they were very eager to have a ride themselves. But it was nearly tea time, and Gumplum said he had more adjustments to make. He left very abruptly, and I wondered what was wrong with him. But knowing Gumplum, I knew it was a waste of time asking. However, the next morning he was up very early and said he was ready to take my wife and the kids with him. They didn't hesitate about climbing into the saucer and once again we moved silently out of the barn. I was just about to remind Gumplum not to rise too fast when, whoosh, there we were up to 20,000 feet. And I didn't feel a thing. How did you do it, Gumplum? I asked. Oh, it's nothing. It is merely a matter of altering the gravitational pull. We had a splendid afternoon flying around. But when Gumplum started to send the machine into space and the world got to the size of a football far below, my wife decided we'd had enough for one day. And I agreed. The children were gazing in wonderment into the darkness of space. But I thought it might be a good idea not to give them too much excitement at one time. The next morning, Gumplum and I got more ambitious. And once, when we slowed down to have a closer look at South America, three fighter planes suddenly appeared. The next moment, the sky was filled with bullets and cannon shells. Gumplum looked amazed and then very, very angry. But he decided to have a game with the planes. Now, the acceleration of the flying saucer is fantastic. But I never realised how fantastic until he started to race the bullets. It was strange to see what looked like a, a string of tiny ships flying alongside us. Then I realised we were doing exactly the same speed as they were. He then accelerated and left them far behind. He banked the saucer around and down and suddenly we were flying right behind the three planes. One of the pilots looked around and his face was a picture. He was opening and closing his mouth like a fish out of water. The next instant he threw himself out of the plane and was plunging down to earth. I knew he had a parachute pack on his back and was not very worried about him. But parachutes were something Gumplum didn't know about. The next moment, I found we were diving after the man. Gumplum pressed a button and a net swung out of the ship, caught the falling man, and in a flash he was in the cabin with us. Well, this was too much for the poor chap. He'd been scared enough before. But he took one look at Gumplum and myself and fainted clean away. Gumplum quickly revived him and spoke to him in his own language. The man's look of terror was replaced by one of delight. Gumplum showed him over the ship and even let him sit at the control chair. But as I said, it was designed for Gumplum for one of his people. And the poor man, although he was a first-class pilot, could not work all the controls with only two hands. We dropped him off at his airfield, and before a carload of officials, all waving their fists at us, could get near, we had soared away. Gumplum flies fast and free. You can do the same if you come with me. Up to the stars and back again. You don't need an airplane. That's may worry, mums will reap. But your date with me you'll keep. With all our traipsing around the world, I'd neglected my home very much. My wife had been asking for months for me to do odd jobs and also decorate the house. Why do you get so very sad when the word decorate comes into your head, Alan? Because I hate it. It can't be very difficult. Show me what to do and I will help you. I laughed hollowly. I was trapped. My wife smiled very sweetly and handed Gumplum a great pile of do-it-yourself books. Gumplum spread them out and memorized them in about half an hour. And now you're an expert at decorating too, are you? I asked sarcastically. Naturally. And he set off down the garden path. Hey, where are you going? Follow me. And he kept going, heading towards the village. You might have told me I could have ridden in the car. You're far too fat. It's about time you got some exercise. 
and with a wicked gleam in his eye, he speeded up. He was quite right, of course, I did need exercise. And Fifteen minutes later, we arrived in the village. Where to now, Gumplov? Where do you expect? And throwing back his heads, he sang. Stay with Gumplov, a painter you will be. Good morning, Gumplumpf, Mr. Jordan boomed. And before his startled gaze, Gumplumpf swept past him behind the counter. With eight pairs of fans working furiously, he soon had a mountain of paint, brushes, stripper and putty on the counter. Deliver them today, please. And deliver them to Mr. Johns, of course. It will be delivered in an hour, replied Mr. Jordan with a large grin. And then his face hardened. And I'd like to be paid by the end of the month, if you please. I nodded weakly and stumbled out of the shop. I was trapped. Gumflump was chatting happily to passers-by and telling them all how we were going to decorate the house. Now, the villagers all knew me and thought this was a great joke. I glared at them and stomped back down the road. Presently, Gumflump came flying past me and, without even a backward glance, disappeared from sight. Oh, no, I groaned to myself. What now? When I arrived home, I found out. My wife was standing at the front door, slightly glassy-eyed. I think Gumplum's gone mad, she complained. You think I snorted? <laughs> I know he has, but uh, why particularly this time? We came rushing in, she explained, and said he was going to decorate the house today. I asked him where he would like to start, and he said by taking all the furniture out naturally. And with a gesture to me to follow, she walked through the house and out of the lounge French windows, and pointing to the lawn, she continued, and there it is. My startled gaze fell upon a whole garden full of furniture, neatly laid out in rooms. Oh, this was too much. Gumflump, I yelled at the top of my voice. Gumflump, come here, you idiot. A bedroom window opened, Gumplum sailed through the air, landing with a thump at my feet. I started back, clutching my brow. Oh, please, please don't do things like that. Gumplum merely laughed and started to move away. Now, Gumplum, my wife said sharply, we really must talk about this. He looked back at us, puzzled. What is the matter with both of you? I thought you wanted the house decorated. I did, said my wife. But for goodness sake, let's do one room at a time. How do you expect us to live in the garden? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Aha, I cried in triumph. At last, you've been too clever for your boots or shubs, whichever you like to call them. Gumflump stopped a moment and his eyes brightened. Don't worry. And with a huge bound, he was over the fence and heading for the village. Twenty minutes later, he was back, carrying a great pile of plastic sheeting. And presently down the road rumbled a lorry piled high with steel scaffolding. A couple of men helped Gumplum unload it, and then looking like some strange acrobat, he'd soon erected a frame of scaffolding round the furniture and stretched the plastic sheeting over it, forming an enormous tent. Well, the children were delighted when they came home, so we decided to make the best of it. I returned to the house to find Gumplum in the attic. He'd already started stripping old beams with a large sanding machine. He'd managed to make himself, I was going to say, a pair of goggles. But of course, with two heads with one eye in each, I suppose I'd have to say two goggles uh, out of some plastic sheeting. His suit was already covered in fine dust and the short hairs on the exposed parts of his body were thick with it. The next week was a kind of nightmare with Gumflumpf working all day and long into the night with his diabolical machine. I followed around with a vacuum cleaner and tried to keep the dust down. Now, the second week, we arrived at the painting stage. Now, although I don't like decorating, I think I'm a dab hand at slapping the paint on. Without a word to Gumplumpf, I grabbed a bucket of emulsion and climbed up the ladder and began to paint the ceiling. Unfortunately, in my effort to impress him, I leaned a little too far forward. The ladder lurched, and I dropped the large bucket of emulsion on top of Gumplumpf's left head and it ran smoothly down his long body. I picked myself up off the floor, aching all over, but laughing at the same time. Gumflump looked a sight. <laughs>
Very carefully, he lifted the bucket off his head, put some more paint into it, and before I could move, quietly tipped it over me. My wife came running up the stairs in answer to my yells. She stopped in the doorway and gasped. Looking back on it, I think we must have made quite a picture. Gumflumpf with half of him white, and me completely white from head to foot. I spluttered as I tried to stand up, slipped, and tumbled back on the floor again. Suddenly, Gumflumpf threw back his other head and roared with laughter. Gumflumpf, if you were more my size, I'd put you over my knee and spank you. And with that, we set to cleaning up the mess and continued our decorating. At last, the inside of the house was done. Gumflumpf moved the furniture back, took down the plastic tent, erected the steel scaffolding around the outside of the house, and in half a day made the house as shiny outside as it was in. The only trouble was that after all that, I felt I needed a holiday. But when I suggested it, I was met with stony stares. I sighed and climbed up into my office to do a bit more writing and earn a few more pennies. There was no doubt about it, Gumflumpf was getting restless. I put down the book I was reading and tossed a log into the fire. The evenings were growing colder and the nights longer. A winter was coming and Gumflumpf moved restlessly around the house. I knew it wasn't fair to keep him with us any longer. I talked it over with my wife first and then we called him. Gumflumpf, I started, I think you should go home. Gumflumpf stared at me for a long moment, but he didn't say anything and turned and went quickly to his bedroom. The next morning he came down to breakfast in a very different mood. I have a plan. My wife and I looked at each other, but before we could ask any questions, he went on. I am very fond of you and very fond of your children. We know that, Gumflumpf, my wife said, and we're very fond of you. His great eyes stared into hers, and presently he asked, Do you trust me? Of course, my wife answered quickly. No, no, think about it. And there was a silence for a moment, and then she repeated, Yes, I trust you. He turned to me. Of course I trust you, Gumflumpf, I said before he could ask the question. I would like to take the three children with me to my planet for a year. You mean... Just the children, queried my wife. That's the problem. That's why I asked if you trusted me. But why can't we all? Well, before I could finish, Gumflumpf shook his head sadly. You and your wife and all the adults of this planet are too fixed in your ideas to leave Earth just yet. Most of the inhabited planets have reached the stage where we all speak the same language. We have no wars. You have not reached this stage yet, and you might confuse people on my planet. But if I take your children with me, our scientists may be able to speed their mental development, so that when they return, they may be able to help you. My wife had listened to this in silence, and now she stepped towards Gumflump and held out her hands to him. I trust you, she said softly and turned and walked quietly back into the house. So, that was that. Except the important factor of asking the children whether they'd like to go. <laughs> there was no doubt about their feelings. When we put it to them, instead of jumping with glee, they nodded gravely and Frith said, Gumflumpf has taught us a little of how to read thoughts, Daddy. We knew. It made me feel a little sad to realize that the children were already cleverer than we were in many ways. In ways that we could never be clever 
But then I suppose that has happened to parents through all the ages. Our great-grandfathers could never have understood the jet age and would have been amazed if they'd seen a television set. All the same, my wife and I lay awake into the night, wondering whether we were doing the right thing. Naturally, I'd have to contact the school authorities in order to get permission for the children to be away. But the scientists from Harwell were very keen on the idea, and so we soon got the blessing of the government. As a final treat, it was decided that Gumflump would take off for his own planet from Hyde Park. Thousands of people gathered to watch. Peter and Paul scampered into the saucer with hardly a backward glance. But Frith stopped, and I thought I saw a tear in her eye as she slowly disappeared from view. Gumflump came last. He shook hands all round, and just before the door swung shut, we heard his voice. There was a loud hum from the machine, and slowly at first, and then faster and faster, it shot upwards until it was a, a dot of shining light. And then, nothing. It was a long time before we moved. I put my arm round my wife and she smiled. Don't worry, she said. Of course we'll miss them, but it's only for a year. And who knows what they'll learn.